everyone, thank you for stopping by my channel. My name's Lara and if it's your first time here, let me introduce myself. I'm an adoptee, adoption wellbeing researcher, coach and psychotherapist. And today I'm talking about attachment style, more specifically attachment style type D, disorganized attachment, and how that might play out in the adoptee in your life. I'd like to do a quick recap today on attachment style, where it began and how we use it to understand our ability to create bonds with others, how we use it in psychology to understand people and relationships and how that attachment um, was initially formed in the life of that person. In 1951, John Bowlby came up with attachment theory and it's never really gone away in terms of how we now look to attachment theory to explain some of the difficulties that we have in relationships, troubles in terms of forming bonds with other people and just how we view the primary care giver in our lives that then goes on to create patterns in terms of how we relate to others later on in adulthood. So in 1951, John Bowlby created attachment theory. Um, his work was later furthered by Mary Ainsworth. In the 1970s, Mary Ainsworth created an experiment that she called the strange situation. And in that situation, what happened was that they were filming um, an infant with, with their mother. And the mother in that situation was behaving in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, that is available on YouTube and I'll link it below. I don't want to go into how the um, experiment itself played out, but suffice to say that Mary Ainsworth then came up with largely insecure or secure attachment styles. Secure being the optimum attachment style and then insecure falling into various other different categories of insecurity based on how safe that child felt with the mother in the situation. So yes, yeah, so Ainsworth continued Bowlby's work. This work has been furthered by lots of research and absolutely, as I said, absolutely holds ground even today. Um, in 1986, Main and Solomon did further research into attachment theory and they came up with a categorization type D. And type D was what they referred to as disorganized attachment. This was focusing on children who had been the subject of some sort of a trauma. At the time, I think it was mainly looking at um, physical trauma. Nevertheless, we now know that physical trauma and emotional trauma have similar impacts in the brain. And so trauma and traumatic experience um, will be felt in, in largely similar ways in an individual. What Main and Solomon found was that type D uh, children were fearful avoidant and one of the descriptors of that was that a child that found their parent to be frightening were very likely to go on to um, develop a type D attachment style. Now of course that makes lots of sense if the child is being physically hurt, if the child is being neglected and there you've got a difference between active abuse and passive abuse. So active abuse being um, physical abuse and passive abuse very often being neglect, which can also have far reaching um, consequences and result in a, in a traumatized individual. What we know about trauma is that it goes on to create traumatic response. The traumatic response can sometimes result in a dissociation. And dissociation is the brain's way of removing you from the reality of what's going on, putting you in a safe space, let's say, when the situation is felt to be more traumatic than which we can actually reconcile. And so in the case of children, obviously with limited abilities to process, with limited abilities to reconcile, then dissociation can very often result after a traumatic experience. Well, of course, what happens is that that works to some extent, that the dissociated state enables the individual to get through the immediate problem. And because that works, then the brain will keep on offering it up as a solution. And so dissociation can carry on into adulthood. 
Um, here in the UK, Carolyn Spring does a lot of work around dissociative identity disorder, and I will link her website in the description below. But dissociation is just one way in which many, many people who have suffered a trauma go on to um, create patterns for themselves in, in adulthood. Dissociation might also be seen to being an internalizing type of behavior as well, where we end up not being able to act out our feelings, that we are taking all of the issues and the thoughts and the feelings and very much keeping them inside of ourselves. Um, so we might see dissociated behaviors as well um, around a type D kind of attachment style. So even though these two ways of understanding the human response are not so far, as far as I'm aware, have not been combined in any experimental studies or research. Um, type D attachment will very often have symptoms of dissociation with that as well. So how does type D play out in the adoptee? What might give rise to a type D disorganized attachment style in an adoptee? Well, number one is the simple fact of separation from the biological parent. Okay, so we know that Chamberlain, who carried out studies into genetic memory, found that babies were able to recognise their mothers soon after birth. And we're using many more senses than the cognitive, the, the sight, the uh, smell, the experience of having been in the, in the womb of, of the woman for, for nine months. And that leading to a recognition of that person and the importance of that person in the baby's life. Chamberlain's work was furthered by Stavros, who also found similar findings, that babies are able to recognise their mother soon after birth. Now, in the case of an adoptee, what that means is the converse must be also true, that a baby will recognise the person who is their primary caregiver and not recognise that person to be their parent. So you already now have a separation issue. You have an anxiety that's already being set up with the baby that is unable to recognise their parent. Now, of course, if you add to that, in the case of adoptees who don't know their origins, who don't know their story, now you're adding another layer to the trauma. What we know um, about trauma and how to heal from trauma is that it's really important to take a two-step approach, the first being grounding techniques to help the person to come out of a, a state of panic or dissociation if that's kicked in. I can talk more about grounding techniques in another video if that would be helpful, um, but grounding is the number one that can be done through breathing or deploying any of the other senses, sight, sound, touch. We use that a lot in the panic response and the, the need to ground in a dissociated state is, is very, very important. But secondly, and this is the longer term work, is that a person suffering with dissociation or type D attachment whereby they're fearful of any kind of a, an attachment with another person needs to create a coherent story about their life and, and about their narrative. Well, in the, in the case of an adoptee who doesn't know what their origins are, there are chunks of their history missing. And so creating that coherent narrative becomes much more challenging because they don't have the story to which they can adjust, the story about which they can process their truth. Added to that, this might result in particular behaviours which if adopting parents are unaware of, might make the adoptive parent feel a bit frustrated, um, a bit confused, a bit upset from time to time. And if those behaviours are manifesting within the household, then that's adding to the disorganised attachment in the adoptee. Because what we need in the case of trauma and what we need in the case of disorganised attachment to others, to the caregiver, to those around us in the case of dissociation and internalizing is to be validated for our feelings to be validated by those around us. Very often what is adding to the discomfort and the, the grief and the trauma and how that then plays out in adulthood when it can turn into anxiety and depression is the shame that could be attached to that. The consequences to the psychological state of a human um, in terms of depression and anxiety and, and inability to reach a state of well-being 
is absolutely huge and we now know that there's a lot of studies that are recognizing how shame can be so debilitating and can hold us back and so working through shame giving an, a person the opportunity to release their shame is absolutely huge so many adoptees have either a big question mark around the start of their life questions about why they were given up and as I've mentioned previously that you might be able to even if you do know your story you might be able to explain it on the one hand um, and get on board with that truth but on the other hand emotionally that's still very painful but if you don't have any pieces of that puzzle then the journey to that releasing of the shame is going to be much much harder but I would say the goal is still the same is to, is to find a coherent narrative about one's life when we are experiencing dissociation, when we are internalizing, when we find it difficult to trust people, um, what we find is that we have all these different parts of the human person that come out with a different role and a different mission and a different goal in order to keep us safe. Um, so there can be at the same time as the person wanting to be isolated because that's what feels safe, there's also a part of that person that wants to be connected. So it's never straightforward and so what we know about our parts is that they are working to keep us safe and the more dominant parts will try to do everything to keep us safe and sometimes that means not having a relationship with another person or not being able to trust in a relationship with another person let's call that type d avoiding relationships at all at all costs finding other people to be hugely threatening and that that brings about a sense of fear so that part of the individual might keep them in a state of isolation but there's still another part in all of us that craves connection there's a part in all of us that doesn't want to feel like that and the way to bring that part more to the fore is to understand what the other part's doing to be compassionate with that other part that's trying to keep us isolated that's trying to make us feel safe um, and to be validated and so when we can release the shame that might be associated with having been given up or anything else around the story of our life, then we're much more likely to go on to achieve greater well-being. Um, so the trauma is very real, but we can add another layer of grief and trauma if there was a disturbing truth about our, our start in life. And, and for many of us adoptees, that's the case. And then how that impacts our sense of ourselves, how that impacts our, our identity. And we know um, through all the work that um, many, many people have done and, and is mentioned in my research findings, the work around identity and how absolutely vital it is to have a strong sense of the self in order to go on to achieve a, a decent level of well-being. So in terms of working through um, disorganised attachment, um, trauma and dissociation, the first thing to do is to understand what situations trigger you, to learn how to ground yourself. Um, and, if, and if you're watching because somebody that you know, or perhaps even your child is an adoptee, teach them those grounding skills. Um, and as I say, I will do a video around that, but largely grounding skills will um, be things like breathing deeply, connecting with all of the senses, visual, um, extremes of temperature, cold, ice, let's say, or warm temperatures. Um, something hot to the touch which will kind of take us out of that dissociated state or that trauma state bring yourself back to the here and now so many grounding te techniques I haven't covered many of them at all in that um, but learning how to ground first and foremost um, and then understanding the reason behind the um, the fear of others the reason behind why we find it difficult to connect with others the reasons behind the trauma um, and then creating a coherent narrative to the, to the best of our ability about that. Even if there are blanks, even if there are question marks in our past, we can still create a coherent narrative about what we know to be true. And what I would advise people to do and what has worked for me is to actually write out the story as you understand it of your life. You are able then to connect with the truth of that. You are more able to connect with that part of you that feels, that feels fearful, that part of you that's trying its very best to keep you safe. And you can give yourself the compassion and you can give yourself the validation. Now, also in the healing process, it's very, very um, important, as we know from all sorts of healing 
um, groups and communities such as 12 Steps, others, you know, that deal with issues of psychological adjustments, let's say addiction, addiction. It's shared experience is really crucial. So if you are an adoptee and you can find others who are in the same boat as you that you can speak to, gain support from. Um, I know many of you watching have younger children. So as they grow up, again, it kind of goes back to this open communication within the family of it not being made to be um, a taboo top topic, it not being made to be a thing that people don't talk about in the house. Um, but then as the adoptee grows up and goes towards adolescence, finding others for, for either yourself or for, the, for, for your child to share an experience with, you know, shared experience, shared narrative is so, so valuable in terms of moving people towards um, a sense of, of well-being. It's all about validation. It's all about releasing the shame. You know, one of the things that we say is that we have to feel to heal. Um, on my well-being playlist, I've talked about processing emotions. Um, and I know that this is something that people struggle with. They, they struggle to understand why it's important. On that video, I go into why it's so important. Um, but we know that in trauma, it's absolutely vital to feel the pain in order to heal from the pain. So one of the goals of creating a coherent narrative for yourself is to be able to feel that. Now yes that's going to hurt if you sit and write your life story out it's, it's probably going to make you cry um, and that's an intense emotional experience but it's one that will move you forward and it's, it's slow work, it's a slow process um, but it is definitely one that will help you to come to terms with the pain, help you to be more compassionate towards yourself, create a coherent narrative for yourself, release any shame that might be at attached to your story, and to move you forward. Okay, so I think the takeaway from all of this is that how could a child that has been given up, abandoned, abused, that a child that's, that's traumatised, how could that child have a secure attachment? How could that child possibly go on in adulthood to create healthy bonds with others without some sort of understanding of how that experience has impacted them? So yes, it's possible. Yes, it's really possible to work through all of that stuff. But without any kind of recognition of the impact of that set of circumstances, then I think people are going to continue to be misunderstood. Recognising that the separation causes lifelong trauma. But first and foremost, compassion towards the adoptee, an understanding of why they might have that type D fearful attachment style. If they're dissociating, then understanding how and why that's happening. And understanding that it's very, very possible to heal from that. I hope you found it helpful. Please like, tell your colleagues, tell your friends, subscribe to my channel if you find this useful. As always, I will be back with more. Thank you.